a video game only conference presentation. So that's what I was doing. It wasn't just awkward pausing. Um, so first off, I want to extend my thanks to the Comparative Drama Conference for hosting this wonderful event again, and to Kevin for uh, being assigned to moderate this panel. And I want to say, sort of preemptorily, that I cite you in my paper, but I wrote this before I found out that you were a panel chair, so this was not a sort of pointless attempt to curry favor. Uh, but I don't judge you lastly, anyway, please continue. Okay. Uh, but then I lastly want to thank uh, the intrepid few who have stayed to the very last conference slot. Um, and then my final sort of housekeeping bit is I want to sort of mention this is going into my dissertation, so any uh, constructive criticism or suggestions or anything would be much appreciated. Um, as Kevin said, the title of this paper is Kill the Pity in Us, The Communal Crisis as Crisis of Individualism in David Griggs, Oedipus the Visionary. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. This is supposed to be a panel about the drama of West and South Africa, but here we're starting with a paper about this Scottish bloke, David Grieg. Now, although uh, Grieg was raised for part of his childhood in Nigeria, he's not actually an African dramatist. But his 2005 play, Oedipus the Visionary, transculturally adapts Sophocles' King Oedipus to a rural community in the mountains of South Africa. Grieg reimagines the Theban plague as the AIDS crisis currently facing Southern Africa and critiques global capitalism and continuing structures of economic apartheid for ignoring the plight of many poor Africans. This paper focuses on how Greek presents the socially corrosive effects of neoliberal free market ideology, which erodes social unities by positioning every individual as a consumer in a competitive marketplace. Uh, this isolation of the individual threatens traditions of collective action among South Africans which helped undermine and eventually destroy legal apartheid. Grieg, I argue, uses the sacrificial crisis of the Oedipus plot to promote collective action as a possible solution to contemporary South African problems, thereby strengthening communities as an alternative to neoliberalism. Grieg's Oedipus is a white farmer who rules a small rural community, effectively maintaining apartheid-style economic relations even without the, the legal apparatus of a racist state. Benefiting from a racist legacy, Oedipus claims individual ownership of the land. I came here. I live and farm this land. It's mine as if it were the land that bore me. As in Sophocles, Greek's Oedipus is strongly individualistic and justifies his rule based on his own deeds, saving the people from tribulations in the past and his promise to do so again in the future. He establishes his arche, his right to rule, by claiming God didn't build the dam or road or drive away your persecutors. It was a man, men, a person, me. If there's a reason for this plague, I will find and cure it. In identifying his right to rule based on his deeds, Oedipus conveniently ignores the history of apartheid inequality which dispossessed the lands of indigenous Africans. He ignores as well the continuing economic inequalities that maintain a functional apartheid in neoliberal South Africa. As Jeffrey Schneider writes, although apartheid era laws limiting black mobility and black voting rights have been removed, economic apartheid is being perpetuated in part by neoliberal policies. The ideology of apartheid, which kept the races separate and unequal, is being replaced by the ideology of the market, which is helping to preserve that inequality. Now, neoliberalism fundamentally attempts to impose a free market ideology in which all interactions come to be viewed in terms of economic, or come to be viewed in economic terms by atomized consumers. However, one practical limitation of neoliberal theory is that it begins from the supposition that all consumers have or can gain access to capital. In areas with histories of inequality, replacing legally enforced segregations with free market uh, with free markets often perpetuates the divisions of inequality between those with access to capital and those without it. More unfounded than the assumption of equal access to capital, but building off of that assumption, is the, the neoliberal assertion that a free market system will break down racism. Milton Friedman makes this claim about the U.S., and according to Schneider, W.H. Hutt, uh, Hutt is a sort of South African neoliberal, economist. 
Hutt's faith in the redistributive powers of the free market led him to conclude that no redistribution of any kind was necessary in South Africa. All that was necessary was the elimination of apartheid restrictions, and the free market would tend to equalize incomes. Now, of course, uh, the reality has been, both in the US and South Africa, that eliminating legal racism without economic redistribution preserves the structures of economic, political, and cultural capital that favored white people. Markets themselves have a complex history in South Africa, and one that tends more towards social instability than the equality and stability that neoliberals promise. Pre-colonial Southern Africa did not have any major markets like those found throughout West Africa. Instead, markets were introduced by European colonialists. B.W. Hodder writes, in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, then, markets post-date European control, are frequently strictly European-introduced phenomena, and in some cases are operated by largely non-indigenous peoples. And Terence Ranger identifies the imposition of traditional markets as part of colonial attempts to preserve indigenous cultures. And I hate using scare quotes, but they seem so appropriate. Um, Ranger claims that markets are part of the necessary and unplanned consequences of colonial economic and political change, of the breakup of internal patterns of trade and communication, the defining of territorial boundaries, the alienation of land, the establishment of reserves. So imposing a market tradition disrupted indigenous economies and power structures in Southern Africa. And the contemporary importance of global capitalist free markets has also had a detrimental effect on South Africa, eroding communal ties that might otherwise have helped more create a more economically just rainbow nation. The problem is that neoliberal free market ideology, which the ANC has brought to South Africa since uh, since Mandela's presidency, atomizes individual consumers, focusing principally on individual rights and property rather than on social justice or economic equality. Friedman, one of the founding fathers of neoliberal political economics, identifies individual freedom as the primary social good, even, I think very bizarrely, uh, critiquing socialism because a society which is socialism can which is socialist cannot also be democratic in the sense of guaranteeing individual freedom. This, for whatever reason, is Friedman's definition of democracy. This, I think, is a bizarre statement because socialism is at its heart democratic, in a sort of real sense of democracy as the power of the people, while nothing in democracy inherently protects individual rights or freedoms. But it's the focus on the individual as the most important socioeconomic unit that strikes me, because this is the basis of neoliberalism's anti-collectivist culture. In Oedipus the Visionary, we see the individualizing action of the market staged. Scene five is set in the town market, where individual members of the chorus imagine what they'll do with the money if they can manage to sell their few personal possessions. The market is a dismal place. It's a space of sad dreams, sickness, and despair. Each chorus member, identified only by gender and a number, has his or her own reason for wanting money. Man one wants to go to Harvard Business School so he can get a good job. Man two wants a happy meal. Woman two wants to hear music and see movies. The culmination of these despairing voices is man six, who wants to drink himself into oblivion and then cut his throat with a broken bottle. This, I suggest, embodies the action of the neoliberal market. Each individual is pitted against one another with nothing of value to sell in a market where no one is buying. Greek's presentation of the market condemns neoliberal capitalism for atomizing individuals, each of whom is responsible only for his or her own desires with no space for civic or social unity in the face of the AIDS crisis. The erosion of the community precipitates what René Girard calls the sacrificial crisis, which he argues underpins the movement of tragedy. Girard theorizes that a crisis becomes sacrificial when the community selects a surrogate victim who can become a kind of lightning rod, attracting all of the violence that would otherwise destroy the community itself. As he puts it, the sacrifice serves to protect the entire community from its own violence. 
the elements of dissension scattered throughout the community are drawn to the person of the sacrificial victim and eliminated, at least temporarily, by its sacrifice. In Violence of the Sacred, Girard traces this as the fundamental narrative structure of Greek tragedies, and Greek maintains the sacrificial crisis structure into Oedipus the Visionary. We see the cultural erosion and self-destructive violence building in South Africa in scene five, culminating in the suicidal dream of man six. His longing for oblivion and then death signifies a larger cycle of violence as the community breaks down, replacing the harmonious potential of the rainbow nation with a set of individuals competing in an indifferent free market sphere. However, the African market also offers the potential for rebuilding unified communities. Now, although they're not indigenous to Southern Africa, in West Africa, traditional markets function somewhat like the bourgeois public sphere described by Jürgen Habermas, the idealized public sphere, and we can sort of critique Habermas for over-idealizing. Um, but markets are spaces to meet people, hear and discuss the latest news, and so on. According to Paul Bohannon and Philip Curtin, markets could be used for many purposes other than buying and selling, to meet your girlfriend, settle a legal dispute, get the latest news, or pay your respects to important elders or chiefs. Marketplaces in Africa are almost as important politically and socially as they are economically. And our esteemed leader, Kevin Wetmore Jr., links African markets to the Athenian Agora, writing, the marketplace of Athens was in many ways the cultural, social, economic, political, and geographic center of the city. Similarly, the marketplace in any African village is the center of everyday life. Now, although markets were traditionally controlled by a local chief or king, their daily functioning was comparatively democratic and comparatively open. And in this sense, I argue that the market made up a kind of commonwealth, or a space of common ownership inhabited by the multitude. And I use these two terms, commonwealth and multitude, in the sense theorized by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. For them, the commonwealth encompasses both an environmental commons, air, water, space, etc., but also the shared products of culture that are required and allow for the continuation and reproduction of culture. So things like language, gesture, affect, ideas, style, and so on and so on. And they theorize that the multitude is a collective group of singularities, by which they mean individuals formed by and inextricable from social contexts. Hart and Negri proposed the common as an alternative form of social organization, contesting late capitalist neoliberalism's emphasis on the individual as isolated consumer and ostensibly beneficial free markets. The openness and communality of traditional markets may offer one model for envisioning an African commons out of which collective action could arise to improve the conditions of the African poor and eliminate the systems of inequality sustained by neoliberal economic apartheid and global structures of inequality. Indeed, in Oedipus the Visionary, we see the collective action and the culmination of the sacrificial crisis. Gerard describes the collective nature of selecting a sacrificial victim, writing, each member's hostility, caused by clashing against others, becomes converted from an individual feeling to a communal force unanimously directed against a single individual. In Oedipus the Visionary, Oedipus comes to stand in for all the evils of colonialism, apartheid, continuing economic apartheid, and the global North's indifference to the AIDS crisis. He must, therefore, be expelled from the community to make it symbolically whole again. As in Sophocles, Greeks Oedipus largely drives his own sacrifice, telling the people, inside my skin is all the agony the world can make. I hold it in me. My skin protects you. Outside my skin, the world is good. But even in his self-sacrifice, Oedipus can never really be expelled from the community. He, re he remains an integral part of the larger identity of the commonwealth. In his pain and shame, Oedipus tries to retain his individuality, the atomized selfhood which neoliberalism envisions as the human condition. But in the face of Oedipus' individual suffering, the community experiences a melting of identities into a commonwealth of universal experience. The priest tells the people, his mind and body dissolved. He became nothing. He became all time. Nature shatters all humanity. We are Oedipus. 
we are nothing. Oedipus is brought back into the fold, back into a shared experience of the world through suffering, and therefore back into a commonwealth of humanity. Uh, Kemba Wetmore again uh, identifies the communal affect of sacrifice in African ritual, noting, in a group context, sacrifice forms a communal bond that joins the participants into a community. Oedipus's pain and shame are part of the human experience, and it's through the collective recognition of this common that it becomes possible to break the cycle of violence constituting the sacrificial crisis. Ultimately, I think that adaptation itself, as a form, promotes a commonwealth. So when Greek chooses to adapt the Oedipus story to protest the cultural and economic violence of neoliberalism, the mode of protest performs the common. In reworking Sophocles' King Oedipus, Greek chooses a well-known piece of Western cultural heritage, which of course has extensive implications in uh, both colonial and post-colonial Africa, but reworking this source material becomes a collaborative process between Greek and Sophocles, and then with the director, actors, tech people, audiences, and communities in which this play is performed. And as Hart and Negri say, multiple people can productively use the same idea, taking it in different directions and developing it in new and different forms to add to the collective stock of knowledge and culture. Therefore, by adapting, we enact a commonwealth breaking down neoliberal notions of ownership in favor of intellectual and performative communities of writers, actors, theater practitioners, audiences, and communities. We create the commonwealth by performing it. Thank you.